What up, HyperChange? Welcome to another episode. Tesla earnings are hot off the press. I just got off the conference call, have gone through all the numbers, have a ton of charts and information lined up here to get you up to speed on Tesla's quarter, the financials, updates on the business, everything. So let's get right into it. Um, so quarterly vehicle deliveries, this is the chart I start with always. We already knew this, but I think this is just important to give you a flavor of Tesla's core metric, how many cars they sold, record quarter, 95,200. So these were the financials leading up until the quarter um, with revenue and operating income. This is what I was expecting the company to report. I put out a video on this a couple days ago. This is what they actually reported. Revenue is 6.3 billion and a loss of about 200 million from the operating income level. So if you see definitely slightly off, but not a huge change there. And I do want to highlight the main trajectory I think is important to focus on is a rapid, you know, top line growth here, almost 50% revenue growth from 4 billion to 6.3 billion, actually over 50% revenue growth. And then the loss improving significantly from about 600 million to 200 million. So on a year over year basis, the business is totally headed on the right direction here. This perhaps the most important number that Tesla is going to report with its earnings is its gross margin. How much is it actually making on every dollar of product that it sells? I was estimating about 17.5%, a nice bounce back. This came in at about 14.5%. So this was part of the, the, basically the main reason that my estimates were a little bit off for the quarter, but still an improvement from Q1 2019. Now, looking at the operating expenses of the business, uh, these were as a real, real bright spot in the quarter. As you can see, that that darker blue line, quarterly operating expenses, were actually down substantially from Q2 2018 and like the lowest in like six or seven quarters, it looks like. Also, you can see that restructuring expense was 117 million, so really low OPEX and a huge port portion of it was restructuring, sort of ideologically non-recurring. So I thought this was a bright, bright spot for the company, really reining in their expenses. Um, energy revenue, revenue for the, the quarter came in at three. 368 million. This was slightly below my 425 million estimate. So a little bit disappointing here, but I think if it's important to look under this surface level metric and see what's actually going on, I think the first bright spot to mention is that gross margin was up significantly to about 12% during the quarter, um, bouncing back from the low of 2% in Q1 2019. So that's obviously a good sign, but also battery deployments. This is the part of Tesla's business that has been on fire and is getting no press, essentially putting in these power walls and power packs to stabilize renewable energy production for the grid. And as you can see, this is up to 415 megawatt hours deployed in Q2, a record quarter. I was, this is way better than I was expecting. And that 373 number in Q1 2018 had a massive project with the Australia, with, in, in South Australia, uh, the world's biggest battery at the time. So that's why that looks so strong. And I can't think of a single huge, you know, 100, 200 megawatt hour project this quarter that really drove this. So I think this was generally just a really strong quarter on all levels for Tesla's battery uh, side of the business really a bright spot. But on the flip side, the other half of the energy business is solar. So solar hit a low of 29 uh, megawatts installed during the quarter, and they do, said they do expect this to turn around soon. I personally just think this is sort of a lost cause to look and, and read too much into this until the solar roof gets perfected, because I think once that happens, Tesla will start pushing into solar installations and solar generation more, but it's just not a priority for now. So the combination of rapidly growing battery business and shrinking solar business is why we're sort of seeing flat or very small growth in the energy side. This was the most important chart, I think, and the most important number. And the best part of the report was Tesla's operating cash flow was 614 million. As you can see in this chart, I mean, Tesla in the past four quarters has become a free cash flow machine. And they did produce about 8,000 less cars than they delivered this quarter. So that was a huge uh, tailwind for cash flow. So, but even adjusting for that, I think this number was super, super strong and, and a bright spot of the business. Moving right along into the shareholder letter, this segues really nicely. I wanted to highlight this, uh, this second paragraph here where they say, as a result of this growth and operational improvements, we generated 614 million of free cash flow, operating cash flow less CapEx in Q2. Combined with our public offering of equity and convertible bonds, net proceeds of 2.4 billion, we ended the quarter with 5 billion in cash and equivalents, the highest level in Tesla's history. This level of liquidity puts us in a comfortable position as we prepare to launch Model 3 production and uh, in China and Model Y production in the US. So Tesla, you know, last quarter they had 2.2 billion, they raised 2.4 billion, so that was like 4.6 billion. I was expecting them to burn through some of that or use it. They actually added to that cash pile. And, and we saw now the end of the quarter with 5 billion in, in, in cash, more than they've ever had in their history. So Tesla's core, I mean, the, the business is getting closer to profitability and closer to free, making money every quarter than it's ever been. And at the same time, Tesla's got the biggest war chest on its balance sheet that it's ever had. So the overall fiscal health of Tesla has never looked better. So I just wanted to highlight that. Um, they, they mentioned autopilot and, and full self-driving features here. 
as safety has always been a priority for us, Model 3 received the highest ever ratings in the safety assist category of Euros, NCAP, new and more stringent testing pro uh, protocols, new active safety features built on our autopilot and fully self-driving hardware and software suite contributed to this achievement. So I, I just think it's, it's it doesn't get enough love that, the, that Tesla is the safest car on the road and is actively pushing to make their cars safer with software as well, not just from a structural perspective. Um, additionally, they say they're making uh, a lot of progress on Enhanced Summon, which is already an early access program so some people are playing with it but that's going to be one of the next big features for tesla's fully self-driving uh, uh package to roll out in the near term they're also making progress on stop signs and traffic lights which is a currently in operating in shadow mode in the fleet which compares our software algorithm to real world driver behavior across tens of millions of instances around the world this is something i personally experienced at the self-driving investor demo day we were watching the car you know read stop signs uh read stop lights when the light changes driving navigating itself on city streets i think this is a huge unlock for the for tesla's overall autopilot and self-driving vehicle program i mean it's one thing a lot of cars have this sort of you know cruise control highway you know self-driving capabilities which makes tesla's autopilot not seem as groundbreaking as it really is but i think once this feature set expands and people can use it on public roads i think the word of mouth the customer satisfaction is going to go through the roof on the fully self-driving piece of the puzzle here so really exciting stuff there in terms of Model 3, in Q2, Model 3 deliveries reached an all-time high of 77,634. Not only was the Model 3 once again the best-selling premium vehicle in the U.S., outselling all of its gas-powered equivalents combined, this product also gained traction in other markets. In Europe, Model 3 is approaching sales levels of established premium competitors. This is what disruption looks like, folks. Selling all of the competitors in your category combined, and you're a new technology platform, which is an electric vehicle, not the internal combustion engine. I mean, this is... People, I just don't think have have grasped how just in the it, as like a historian looking at the automotive industry, how fast and how much disruption and sales have been displaced by the Model Three is is almost unprecedented. So I think that's worth highlighting. They say during the quarter, a majority of orders continue to be for long range battery option, which basically kept the ASP at fifty thousand. This is really encouraging. If you remember a long time ago, even people like me were modeling that Model Three's average selling price over time would would stabilize around forty five thousand. So to see that start coming in around fifty thousand a really good sign. Also, they aim to produce 10,000 total vehicles of all models per week by the end of 2019. So production capabilities, I think this is pretty much just at Fremont, uh, maybe at Shanghai Gig as well, hitting 500,000 units per year by the end of this year. That's the, the production capacity run rate. Giga Shanghai, this will be a simplified, more cost-effective version of our Model 3 line with the capacity of 150,000 units per year to start. The pace of, of innovation here is going to be crazy, and I, I'm really, really excited to really to see what this Model 3 production line looks like and, and how this gets off the ground. They say we are looking forward to starting production in China by the end of this year. Depending on the timing of Gigafactory Shanghai ramp, we continue to target production of over 500,000 vehicles globally in the 12-month period ending June 30th, 2020. This is a really interesting piece of guidance saying that basically in Q3, Q4 of this year, plus Q1 of next year, and Q2 of next year, those four quarters going forward, they want to build 500,000 cars globally. And, you know, Tesla's on track to deliver 360 to 400,000 cars this year. So to see them shoot for continued growth towards half a million units next year, I think is a really encouraging sign. Model Y, preparations beginning, officially going to be at Fremont, where they're building it. Um, a huge overlap of production. So this is going to make, uh, they're leveraging existing manufacturing designs and setup from the Model 3 to ramp this much quicker. Um, so that's exciting. Additionally, energy and Powerwall uh, deployment, like I showed in that chart, up 81% to a record 415. Powerwalls are now more installed at more than 50,000 sites. That's an awesome achievement. I, did, I thought this was a funny tidbit. They say, additionally, cell supply combined with our new module design designed by Groman, uh, by Tesla Groman, enabled a step change in energy storage production. So Groman Acquisitions, the manufacturing company from Germany, is actually being leveraged to, to improve battery production. I thought that was really interesting. Didn't see that coming. Um, but they also say in terms of the solar, we are in the process of improving many aspects of this business to increase deployments. Last thing, Outlook part of the letter. Uh, this quarter, we are simplifying our approach to guidance. We are most focused on expanding our manufacturing footprint in new regions, launching new products, and continuing to improve the customer experience while generating and using cash sustainably. Uh, they say we remain on track to hit local Model 3 production in China by the end of the year, Model Y in Fremont, fall of 2020. Uh, they're working towards uh, increasing delivery sequentially and annually. They basically reiterated their guidance of 360 to 400,000. But um, I do think it's interesting here that they, they expand on it and saying, additionally, we, we expect positive quarterly free cash flow with possible temporary exceptions, particularly around the launch and ramp of new products. We believe our business has grown to the point of being self-funding. This is the biggest takeaway. They mentioned this more on the call, but the $5 billion in 
cash, the improving cash flow situation, ramping deliveries and business. And Tesla is really getting to that point of being self-funding. I know that's something that a lot of bulls have been talking about for the past year, and it's taken some time, but this is a huge fundamental change in Tesla's overall business. They continue to aim for gap net income in Q3. Um, so th they're sticking to that guidance, although Elon kind of walked it back on the call. And then they do kind of caveat it saying like, we have other things that we're focused on besides just hitting a gap profit. Then last thing, CapEx guidance down to 1.5 to 2 billion, a reduction from what it was before. Okay, now the fun part, the conference call where we get clarity on the results, the Q&A session with Elon Musk. So it opens up with Elon uh, taking questions, giving the opening remarks. He says, we delivered 95,000 cars uh, this quarter, a record for Tesla. He sort of really harps on this idea, which which I agree with, which is the, the, the level of growth is unprecedented for any complex manufactured product in history. He's extremely proud of the team. I mean, Tesla's vertically integrating, going over 100%. He even says he expects uh, growth to continue for years to come at the 50 to 100% level, which I think is a really good sign that things are going to keep growing from here in 2020 and beyond, which of course we know, but it's encouraging to hear him say that. Um, and he says it's not appreciated how difficult it is to grow at that rate. Uh, Model 3, best-selling premium sedan, outselling competition combined, which I already mentioned. Uh, he said Motor Trend said the Model S was the best car they've ever tested in their 70-year history. Um, and he says even since they've evaluated that, we've done the Project Raven, we've done suspension, we've done a ton of different stuff as well. Um, I thought it was interesting. Elon was kind of throwing in a mix of like boilerplate statements, but also off the cuff comments. So always interesting to see them like try and get him to read a script, but then him kind of throw in his own little anecdotes. And he says Shanghai Gigafactory uh, on track. They're finalizing the European Gigafactory site by the end of this year, which is really encouraging. They're moving much faster than I expected on that front. Um, and then once again, saying Model Y is going to be easier to ramp the Model 3. They're adding new service locations, new service fleet vehicles, uh, and they're making more car. The bottom And the bottom line is Tesla's making more cars basically every year than they have in their entire history before that combined. Um, and so, and he says year over year, if you look at the cumulative deliveries chart, it's of Tesla, it's about the most perfect exponential curve he's ever seen. Service has improved considerably. Um, if we were doubling, since we're doubling our fleet every year, managing service is, is, is very difficult and a challenge, it needs to scale with the fleet um, and they wanna do it sensibly from a cost standpoint. And so they're working on that. Um, he also says they're at a huge milestone be, given that they're being ready to be self-funding, positive cash flow going forward, uh, with the caveat that unless they have a big new product ramp, that won't be the case. Additionally, he says, this is kind of the Im important part. He says, from profitability and break even this quarter to profitable next quarter. So they're sort of walking back that guidance of Q3 positive gap income in, in Q3. And they're saying, might have a loss in Q3, but we want to be profitable in Q4. So I think the market's not going to like that, but that that's what it is. Um, deliveries expected to be 360 to 400,000 in line with the previous guidance. Then he brings on Zach Kirkhorn, the new CFO. He says, Q2 was strong, proud of the team, record vehicle production, record vehicle deliveries, record storage production, record storage deliveries, uh, gross mar margin improvement across the board. Uh, when you back out the regulatory credits, very strong free cash flow, only partially attributed to working capital benefits. Basically what he's saying right there is that this isn't just a one-time thing because they sold more cars than they produced. There actually is fundamental improvements going on in the cash generation of Tesla's business. That's a good sign. Ended with $5 billion in cash, highest in company history, net loss reduced significantly from Q1, even with $117 million in restructuring. Uh, one-time expenses. He says there was a, I believe I got this right, a 400 million credit reduction in terms of credit sales that didn't hit this quarter from last quarter. I don't know if that's right though, but a big step down in regulatory credits also hit them this quarter. And then a 66 million foreign exchange hits, which they don't hedge for. Um, so adjusting for those credits, once again, gross margin improved dramatically. They're very happy with that, stabilizing ASPs. Um, and even though uh, Model 3 ASPs were down in Q2 versus Q1, gross profit per vehicle improved. Um, and also, they, they did want to highlight that they're they are deferring a lot of the revenue for full self-driving. We're going to get to more on this later. But so not all of that revenue, let's say you pay for the FSD package, is actually getting recognized by Tesla, even though they're getting the cash, which is one of the reasons the cash flow looks stronger than the operating results. And then he says, OPEX and CAPEX seem unnaturally low this quarter but they're just really results of cash management program. That's a really encouraging sign. Uh, Tesla's been doing a lot of work to cut costs, and I think that's paying off. And he says, long-term, uh, the journey, Tesla's on track. It's difficult to see every quarter, but he, he thinks they're really at a key inflection point given they're demonstrating significant organic demand for their products. Nearly all orders in Q2 were not from reservation holders, and Q3 orders are already outpacing Q2, and that he feels like they've gone through a major fixed cost barrier with the Model 3, and that's a step change in the actual fundamental cash flow profile of the company, which we're actually seeing play out in the numbers with my cash flow chart there. 
Next 12 to 18 months, extremely exciting. China Giga, Model Y, European Giga, self-driving suite, Energy Biz will grow. These are all on the table for the next 12 to 18 months. Um, and he says, we intend to grow and invest as fast as possible, and we are in great shape for that phase of growth. Elon closes it out, and they, this is get, gets kind of awkward. Basically, he's like, oh, wait, we have one more thing. Basically, announcing that Drew, or J, announcing that J.B. Straubel, the CTO of Tesla, will be transitioning to a senior advisor role. Drew will be stepping up in his place. This is something that I've been speculating for a while. If you watch my video on the shareholder meeting, you know I saw kind of saw this coming. I think a lot of people are going to freak out about this, but it's just so, it's a perfect example of why nobody gets Tesla and people aren't doing good homework on it. It's like the CEO was there for 16 years. He's transitioning to an advisor role. Someone who's been there for more than a decade working under him is going to transition into the role. I mean, this is pretty standard how it works, but it is notable that JB, one of the co-founders, I believe, of the company is transitioning away. Then we move into the Q&A portion of the call. Say, Tesla, uh, the say questions, uh, start the call. That's awesome. The first one is, Tesla is supply constrained, not production constrained. So why lower costs? Elon basically says there's two dimensions to affordability, like basically saying like we have to make a cheaper car. That's our goal if we want to sell it to everybody and make it affordable. So we just have to hit certain prices. Um, and there's sort of this balance between making the car more affordable and keeping their margins. And they do say like the tax credit fell by 2000 in the US this quarter. So they did just drop the prices of the standard Model 3 by 1000 um, so they're kind of trying to mitigate those tax credit falling off by cutting prices. Additionally, Kirkhorn adds some color that says we actually cut the, the prices of the higher performance models even more than the standard model so that the, the order mix shifts to the higher ASP models and that it sort of cancels itself out. They also say they're making huge cost efficiencies on the Model 3, and so the net gross margin on the Model 3 should continue to grow. Elon adds some really important color here saying fully self-driving is very important uh, for gross margin and only a portion of features have rolled out um, of fully self-driving. So they can't recognize all of that fu fully self-driving revenue. They'll recognize it as those features roll out. And the second layer to that is demand for fully self-driving is limited because all these features are theoretical. But as fully self-driving moves into the picture, we're going to see a huge tailwind on the financials from, in terms of that revenue recognition and more people are going to do it. So what does this translate to in gross margin over time, potentially improving some substantially relative to other automakers and what Tesla's historically reported in the past. Um, so a question about Battery Investor Day. Elon basically says this is going to be in February or March of next year, which is much later than I originally expected. Um, and he says we want to show a clear manufacturing plan to how to get to a terawatt per year of energy storage. They're at about 30 gigawatt hours now. So that'll be like a 30x increase, potentially even two terawatts, a 60x increase in battery cell production capacity. And so there's this made me way more excited for Battery Investor Day, but a lot to unpack there. Next question about customer service was a priority. Um, can you update us on what's been done? Elon says, I'm meeting with the service team multiple times per week. We had all the service heads fly to Fremont. We want service to be so good, it's rarely required. Basically eliminate the need for service. Jerome even adds, uh, the best service is no service. And so the biggest thing they're doing with service is moving parts from distribution warehouses out to actual service centers. This is rapidly reducing the times to actually fix those cars. And they added in like a funny tidbit, which is that the number one reason people get service for their car is to ask how to use auto pilot. So it's even like just them educating people would dramatically reduce the burden on the service part of the business. But like Elon said, this is a huge priority for Tesla as the fleet scales is improving that customer service experience. Uh, question: Another question from Say, Gigafactory 1 at 23 gigawatt hours of output versus the 35 capacity. Is Tesla still stalking train? What's going on there? Drew steps in and says, we've actually seen improvements in the 23 number. We're in the high 20s now, about 28. They're not cell constrained or at least cell production is ramping the manufacturing ramp rate. Question about Lothrop facility. I know a ton of people have been speculating this. It's just a new distribution and storage warehouse for parts. Not a big deal. Then they go into the Q&A with analysts. Wolf Research starts it off asking like, okay, the China business is about 3,000 cars per, per month now. It seems like we don't have exact clarity on that. What's, what's the China demand going to be when you actually launch there with the made in China car? Um, they basically say we don't want to try and predict it too much, but longer term demand for the Model 3 in China is expected to be about 5,000 cars per week. Um, then they have a follow-up about whether they would source cars um, from Europe, or wh whether they would sell cars into Europe from that China Gigafactory. They basically say no. Um, all the cars from Europe are getting sold into Europe are going to be built at Fremont till now until they get the China, the, until they get the European Gigafactory online, which is set to come online in 2021, or that's what the loose guidance was that Elon mentioned, which is huge. And I, I also think that Elon says that longer term, he throws in a tidbit that global demand for the Model 3 could be 700,000 or 15,000 units per week, which is 780,000 units per year, which is higher 
higher than he said in the past. And I think a really good clue that Model 3 demand is, is really coming through now that they've gotten past those initial orders. Bernstein comes in with a question about the tax credit um, and then not too much there, but he does have a follow-up about Model 3 cannibalizing SNX sales. Why are SNX sales basically a structural step down from what they were before Model 3 really hit scale? They think a little bit of it's cannibalization. They think a little bit of it is cannibalization, of course. I think that's a huge part of it. The other part of it is this rumor of a refresh, and Elon's basically saying, we got to work on our communication to tell people how good the new SNX are, because they don't think they realize it, but they're sort of internally also trying to figure out why the sales mix has shifted so much. Um, Deutsche Bank comes in, guidance for 25% gross margin for SX and 3. Is that no longer in play? Because I think he was implying the S and X gross margins weaker. Elon's, well, if you factor in the, gro the gross margin from full self-driving, which is deferred, it would look a lot better. And basically saying longer term, gross margin of 30% is likely with this. This is a huge thesis that I, I, I've been thinking about that I think is getting hugely overlooked is that at a bigger port, as, as a bigger portion of Tesla's vehicle sales move to software, you know, people are saying more and more money on that fully self-driving package. That's all software. The incremental sales for Tesla to push a software update to you is zero. It's a hundred percent margin. And so in the car business, when you're, when you're pinching pennies, is making such few thousand dollars or such a little bit of money per car that incremental profit can have a huge difference and i think tesla is a uniquely positioned among all automakers to capture a huge piece of their revenue in software and that have lead them to have a fundamentally higher gross margin and operating margin than anyone in the auto business and so to see elon sort of confirm that was really awesome Zach also throws in that nearly every week we're hitting record lows of labor hours uh, to build Model S and X. And they say, once again, from Q1 to Q2, gross profit of Model 3 actually expanded, even though with the lower pricing mix. So those cost efficiencies are really improving the gross margin. And then Elon says, from a core financial health standpoint, our fiscal discipline is dramatically better than it was in the past. This is, I think, the biggest takeaway from this whole, we're going to be profitable, we're going to be cash flow positive, that fun, big, we don't want to raise money. That whole thing that went down last year was actually a really big growing up moment for Tesla where, where they aren't relying, where they sort of went from like this startup funding everything mode, like we're just growing and burning money to like, okay, let's look at our costs. Let's rein this in. Let's build a more mature business. And I think that very arduous year long process is starting to really show up in the financial results. Uh, JMP Securities, do you have uh, space in Fremont? Are you reconfiguring space? And they are like, yes, we are. A ton of the factory space is used for S and X parts, uh, not actually parts of the line. We don't need that there. So that's where we're going to put the Model Y productivity. And then Jerome's like, every six months you're at the factory, it's hard to find your way around again because it's so different. This is something I relate to so, so well. And Elon is even throws it in like the, the rate of improvement, the pace of innovation at Giga and Fremont is incredible. And as someone who's visited the pack factory like several times over the past year or so every time i see it it's different there's something new it's working better they've improved something that is the biggest takeaway for tesla pace of innovation at the manufacturing level is so much is so far beyond any other automaker what the status quo is in the industry that it's a huge competitive advantage and as a follow-up can you can we see you making 7,500 to 8,000 model threes per week by fremont at the end of the year kind of a smart ass analyst question they're just like yes we want to get to that 10k number for all three lines or for all three cars all three products by the end of the year Credit Suisse, asking about regular, regulatory credits. How should we think about the recognition of this revenue? And uh, they basically said, like, some regulatory credits are based on production. They come in every quarter. Some are super lumpy. And so they're not expecting a meaningful in increase in credits next quarter. But going forward, they do expect credits to be a part of the business. Colin Rush. Oppenheimer, uh, where are you going to source your batteries from for China? They didn't really want to answer this, but then they give really interesting more cl clarity on the battery day, which is say like, we want to go up 100x. Like we're at, if you include Panasonic lines in Japan, we're at like 30 or 35 gigawatt hours of overall battery production. We want to go up 100x from that, several terawatts of battery production. And that's kind of the roadmap and technology that they want to unveil at Battery Powertrain Investor Day, which they also confirm in this part of the call is happening in February or March, later than like the summer or fall 2019 that we thought. So early 2020, they are basically going to do the show and tell for this battery uh, cell production roadmap that sounds w even more exciting than I thought is this, this new terawatt hour buzzword and clue. Then they talk about sustainable volume and pricing for the Model S and X. And Elon is like, look, it kind of jokes. It's like the main reason we have the S and X is so we can still spell sexy with our product lineup, which I think is kind of funny. But he's like, look, 
Demand for the Model 3 is going to hit 750,000 units per year. Model Y is going to be 1.25 million. That's 2 million total. Throw in the pickup, throw in the semi truck. Model S and X are going to stay about 80 to 100,000 units per year. That's about 4 to 5% of unit volume or less. And just shrinking, it's just getting smaller and smaller. They're great products, but they're not important, really that important to us for the long term. This actually, some people may be freaking out about this. This made me so, so happy. I mean, when you hear a company that's not afraid to disrupt its own products, that's not afraid to say we're going to outgrow our products, I mean, the Model S and X were Tesla's cash cow. Like so many other companies would have just sat on them and just milked it, and Tesla disrupted it with the cheaper Model 3 and it's like, look, we're going to sell, we're, that was, the Model S and X were an amazing brand stepping stone and stepping stone in perfecting this technology, but the holy grail is not selling 80 to 100,000 luxury cars. It's inflecting the world to renewable energy and that requires much cheaper products, way bigger battery production. And, and that's where the story of Tesla is going to migrate to the next years is, is this much bigger growth trajectory of not, let's not sell 100,000 cars per year, let's sell millions. Research, Pierre Fergu asked about the distribution, you know, uh, what are you going to keep opening retail stores, online sales? Not too much clarity there. They're basically going to keep doing what they're doing. But they do say um, an interesting tidbit that Elon adds is like people around the world want the same thing when they want to buy a car. Look, service location that's convenient, supercharging uh, and charging overall that's well sorted out, good financing options available, and price must make sense. Those four things, when we have them, our sales in that region are amazing. And so I think that's what they're focused on. He basically says service centers are the key to sales, not retail stores, as well as superchargers being incredibly important. And so I think that's a really interesting tidbit is that the service piece of the business is almost driving more sales than the retail footprint. RBC was asking about fully self-driving and whether that would be available in China. China or not, they said yes, it would be the one place around the world where the regulatory environment isn't as good for full self driving is Europe, where there's an old regulatory committee or some sort of rule in place they're gonna have to get through. So it's gonna take a little bit longer to get that done in Europe, but should be fine everywhere else. So that wraps up the the conference call. You know, overall, I've I've gotten a lot of sentiment from people like on Twitter and and people on my live stream commenting that like, oh, this is a horrible quarter for Tesla, or like, oh my God, it was such a bad quarter. I think first of all, you gotta realize that companies don't miss estimates, analysts miss reality. I never read analyst reports like what they're doing relative to what some analysts thought just does not matter. It's all about the fundamental trajectory of the business. I'm seeing a business that's growing rapidly, that has a product that's outselling all of its competition, that is pumping out hundreds of millions of cash flow. I mean, if you look at it, if you add the previous four quarters up, the previous three quarters before this, Tesla did 309 million in operating income. You add in the loss of 167 million, we're still about 150 million in positive operating income over the past four quarters. Look at the free cash flow chart. This is by far my favorite uh, chart for Tesla. I mean, in the, in the past four quarters, they've produced almost 1.5 billion in free cash flow. Operating cash flow is even higher, but, but free cash flow of 1.485 billion in the past four quarters. So, I mean, this is a company that is already producing free cash flow. They've already produced positive earnings in the past four quarters. And, and I just think, you know, they have 5 billion on the balance sheet. This is the biggest war chest Tesla's ever had. So from a long-term, will Tesla succeed? What are their chances of success? I think this has never been higher. I've never been more confident in the long-term story. I mean, as the stock was going down before this report, I've been buying as much Tesla stock as I can, even got some in the 180s. And so personally, I mean, I'm not a financial advisor. It's not financial advice, but my game plan is the market is is reacting negatively to this news when it's just a mist of the headline number but the core fundamentals and trajectory of tesla are right on track they're in, they've never been in better financial health um the product lineup is so so exciting it's it's been de-risked i think uh people are losing sight of the bigger picture of this american success story of probably the most disruptive and fastest growing company in the 21st century in the world especially when you consider they're actually building the physical product i mean the achievements that tesla's made is incredible so um you know yes, I'm a little bit bummed that they didn't hit my numbers, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Like looking, getting too hyped up or too disappointed about one quarter number is the wrong way to look at things. I think, you know, Tesla's business can be very lumpy each quarter. One quarter, everyone's pumped. The next quarter, everyone's sad. Like, I just think you have to take a step back and look more longer term at the trajectory of Tesla and the long term trajectory has never looked better. So this is HyperChange. Uh, that's my recap of Tesla's Q2 2019 earnings. You can go to hypercharts.co slash Tesla if you want to look at more charts and stats about the quarter. I'll put a link in the description. Um, also, huge shout out to our Patreon supporters, producers funding the channel. And if you have any questions, comments, or anything about the quarter, your analysis, leave it below. I want to know it all. I'll be reading the comments all night. Anyway, this is HyperChange. See you guys next time. Peace.